Good evening, everyone. How are you doing tonight? It's day four of 30 days of going live every night, every day. I'm Lana, and I'm doing a Facebook takeover on Tom's account. Woohoo! What, what? So, we're going to be a little bit more serious tonight. I'm going to pull a hook em out of my journal. And if, for those of you who've never seen me pull a hook em, I do this every, every uh, Monday night. I'm a little late tonight. I uh, was busy in the kitchen. And I've got my water. you got to be drinking lots of water. I didn't drink enough water today. I definitely realized that. And so you got to get your hydration on. So hopefully this is going to inspire those of you out there who have never considered journaling because journaling is a wonderful way to process your life, get your mind out of your head, put it down on paper and reflect. And it's very cathartic because when you write things down, you release them. And when you put it on paper, it's also like a recognizing of where you're at. And you can start to question your mind, where is this coming from? And just keep writing and it'll bring up other stuff, right? And so I've also got kombucha over here on the side, a little melon vanilla. Mmm, tasty sweet. Mmm. So tonight, I reached in my bookcase, and this is coming from four, four years ago now. This is from 2013, and 2013 is when I moved back from Italy. I had just started going back to the yoga studio in the beginning of the year, and in the, about this time, four years ago, I started my Kundalini Yoga teacher training. And I had already been, for years I've been working on going within and recognizing old patterns and belief systems that I have held and have held me back in my life, right? And I'm very humbled because this is now my second year in supporting the yoga teacher training at the community uh, yoga village that I attend. I've been going there since 2009. And just this past weekend, we had three days of an amazing Kundalini Yoga teacher training weekend. It's the second weekend. And I can tell you, some of us were discussing how much we've grown from over these years that we've known one another. And like I said, I've been going to the studio since 2009. And that's when I was into my hot yoga and I was more Ashtanga based much more hardcore and even before that I was really high impact into running uh, distance running kickboxing you name it I was into it because I was always so busy in the mind I had to physically move my body that was my way to get out of my head or really I wasn't out of my head but it was a way moving meditation for running I would get into this breathing pattern I had this cadence that every time my foot would hit the ground and every time I take in my breaths it would be and I had a pattern down and I would just meditate on my breathing back then and I didn't even realize that's what I was doing sure that I was processing it's how I would get through a lot of this mind chatter was through my physical exercise and so that's what a lot of us do. We don't think about the fact that meditation is single-minded focus. Anything that you put your full attention on is a meditation. And then when the thoughts are processing, they're coming in, they're dropping into your awareness, you can watch them because you're single-mindedly focused on one thing, you're able to witness. When the thoughts drop in, you can go, oh, Instead of responding, reacting, or attaching to those thoughts, you can, you can either just, okay, be aware of them and let them pass through, but if they stick around because now you're fixated on them, 
that's the opportunity to to really reflect, to question those thoughts, to go, where's this coming from? Where does this originate? And when you can trace it back as the witness, as the observer, where that all starts, that is, that's the key to, to integrating, to bringing yourself back to wholeness. Because we lose pieces of ourselves along the way. We lose pieces of ourselves along the way because of past hurts, pains, and traumas. And that's where all these stuck attachments, we, we attach to something else because we lost a piece of ourselves, right? And if you're missing a piece of yourself, you go outside because you don't recognize that it's all within you. You go outside of yourself and that's where addictions come into play. That's why you go into unhealthy relationships and unhealthy behaviors unhealthy boundaries. All those unhealthy patterns in your life are as a result of the things that you, those pieces you feel you lost along the way through the traumas and the pains and the hurts all in your life. It's like that took a chunk out of you, but it really didn't. All you need to do is accept that with wholeness and you reintegrate it back into your life. And recognize that you're whole just as you are and that that was simply an experience not to be suppressed not to be shoved away but to make to give you the strength because it's through our challenges we find our gifts those are our biggest blessings you know the blessings without the bows or we say the gifts without the bows they show up in our lives because it's all part of the the path that our soul decided it wanted to take along this journey our soul said, okay, here's what we want to do, we want to experience, and, and truly, and this is, this is what I've learned through my practice from me, and you don't have to listen and take my word for it, but try it. It's up to you. I just share my experience. That's all I can do. I'm not here to fix anyone, but if anything, I hope to inspire you to do your own inner searching, your own inner work, to recognize if this resonates with you. And if it does, I, I feel very grateful if I can actually inspire that within anyone. Even if it's just one person. Even if it's just one person. Or not. You know what? It's all good. It's all perfect. So when we feel lost along our path and when we need to bring it back and reintegrate into our soul, because we are souls first and foremost. We are love. This body, this physical form, and this mind is all just a vessel. It's like our, 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 our ship. It's like our, you know, it's just, it's how we're having the experience. And what I have found and I have felt is that we are all source. And because we are one, we see things separate. We see things different. We have these polarities good bad because of the mind and we came to this life with the mind that was meant to be our servant not to be our master and so often it becomes our master and then we all create it creates its suffering that we experience because the mind actually can never truly experience anything it's just up here Yes, it's very helpful to discern. It helps you recognize when, they, you know, like in fight or flight for survival mode. That's really what it's meant for. But most of the things it's picking up on as fight or flight tend to be things that are not really life-threatening, right? And so my feeling has been that Truly, if there's a source, whether it's God, it's universe, whatever it is, and it's all energy, we are all connected as one through that. And it's intangible. It's an essence. You can't put anything on it. We have all, in a way, have, ex have agreed upon that this is what a physical form is going to look like, or we couldn't visually see it. And so that's how connected we are, that we could look at a phone and say, that's a phone. This is a journal. This is a book. I'm wearing clothes. I've got a necklace on, rings, what have you. I have hair. I have eyes. 
These are things that if we all recognize and see it the same, then we must have agreed upon it being such. And we're connected enough to be able to identify it as it is. And we all agree. Whether in a language that we understand or not, we still agree. And it's a, it's a craziness that when you really wrap your head around, you're like, wow, that's pretty intense. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That we're so connected that we have these agreements that we never recognize and take, take it as, as like, wow, look at that. But then we have a lot of things that we agree upon that aren't necessarily serving us too, right? So we have to reprogram and rewrite our stories and recognize where it's all really coming from. And so with the soul coming into this life, and this is my, again, this is a belief in, in a sense that I've had for a very long time, that there is a, there is a path that's going to unfold and that I have felt that the true source has decided that I want to have all these different experiences randomly through all of these different people, through all of these souls that drop down into these bodies. And so can you imagine being the source of all that is? basically taking pieces of itself. I, I don't even like to say pieces because truly it's, there's no separation. But we're each an essence of that divine source. And if I want to know personally, this is the cool thing for me, is that there's, there's this divine source of whatever you want to call it. And it, we're all pieces of it. We all have an individual unique experience and expression. And we came down to have it, this life, so that the source of all that is could experience through each of us individually. Whether good or bad doesn't matter. They're all just experiences. And so there's an actual agreement of what will unfold for each and every one of us. And even when we think we have control, do we really or is it already pre-laid out? We do and we don't. It just is. And it's too much to really put yourself into that mindset and even go there. You can make yourself crazy. But just recognizing the wholeness and in in, that we are so connected, can you imagine? So this is, the, this is the, the really, like, this is me, excited about. I want to be the divine source because can you imagine? The divine source of all that is is experiencing all these individual expressions of each and every one of us at once. What is that like? You think you got it bad as one person, whatever you're going through, or good, whatever. And there's a source up there going, ah, oh, it's like a smorgasbord of all these little delightful tastes of people and essences, but on a mass scale. It's like going to a buffet to eat, and sources up there are going through all these different experiences. I personally think it is the coolest thing to fathom. And so I don't know where that came from. I wanted to share that. It just came out of me. And I just, I have always felt like that has to be the coolest thing. It's just, you know, and it, and it humbles us if you think in that way that there's so much more to life than trying to get caught up in the, oh, what was me or whatever. It's like, find the source of who you are and embrace it and be in joy. And don't get so caught up in the attachment to to stories or or labels because that's what takes you out of things and we really came into this life to reconnect to our soul and not put everything into these little boxes and that takes us out of the enjoyment of everything that we came here to have for an experience right we don't have who has time to put everything into these little itty bitty boxes I mean that make you crazy in itself so going back to my journal hook'em, I opened up, I just pulled this, this journal from 2013 and I just wanted to see where was I at and I was going to look up specifically today's date, but this, there's a lot of random entries in here. So I know I was going through so many different things and I was probably writing in more than one journal anyway and I have like, I even have notes that I printed out from that year that are tucked in here and I have little cards and I have all sorts of little goodies in here like you know it's just like one journal that I brought to India I had I had tucked in leaves that I had collected at Osho's um, Osho has a center in Pune 
and uh, it, was, it was, I have some, a lot of the leaves, and they were in the shape of hearts, yeah, so, oh, I need to throw some of this stuff out, <laughs> see, and this is the other thing that's cool, is I start going through here and go, oh, wow, I need to, yeah, I need to check these out, and I even have a little note card that's sealed, ooh, I might pull that out, too, so here's the date that I'm going to read from. It's 11 October of 2000, and I said 13, right? So it's four years ago, right? The beginning of this says 2014, or 13, sorry, 2013. Okay, all right. Self-realization. When the mind is not needing to know because the essence of being guided is present, you shouldn't try to push out the mind, but train it to be the witness to self. It's, that, it's not that we need to silence the mind as much as we need to train it to serve us, right? I was always under, it was always understood to me, and I knew the importance of the breath. It's healing, maintaining, sustaining, revitalizing life force. But it wasn't until after my first weekend of Kundalini teacher training that I truly experienced it. On the Monday morning, my body felt amazing, aligned, alive, energized, and pain-free. All of my life had been anything but simple, yet I can see the blessings and divine guidance always present. What many may conceive, consider or call difficult just was for me. Challenges were the norm that most would avoid or struggle with or surrender and walk away from, but I never saw the choice to do anything but persevere through. Resistance was a push-pull. Struggles to overcome were what drove me. I was subconsciously resisting exactly what manifested in my life. That is why I continued to repeat experiences drawing in that struggle. Whew. You know, and again, you know, you don't know what you're going to, what I'm, I don't know what I'm going to read. I didn't really read this beforehand. I just saw the title portion and looked at the dates because I wanted to see where I was around this time. And um, that really brings something up for me right now. And sometimes we forget. You know, I just experienced, I just shared with you that we tend to put a label on things of good and bad and when really our soul just simply came through this vessel, this body, for a, a bigger purpose to have experiences that just are random for each of, they're unique to each and every one of us. They're not even random though because it clearly was meant to unfold in a certain way and yet we tend to identify with whether it was a struggle or whether we resisted because you know the only way you can recognize the beauty in things is to see polarities to see the separation to recognize the divinity in the central neutral point of those two can exist without the other and then when you come and bring them back to balance you have perfect wholeness So that was just that entry, but on the 10th of November, I had a Kundalini teacher training. Our body is our vehicle, just as the Indian gods and goddesses, deities, so are we. Using Ayurveda with raw food, other concepts as well, acid versus alkaline, licking my lips as, I, as a child. Mom said it, it would heal a cut, but I ended up getting a cold sore never knowing that back then I had, a, I had a reaction to foods like that. And uh, yeah, that was, that was just that time. And that was all I really wrote for those two days. Whew. So I'm just curious what I wrote in here. So I must have written this. I 
believe I wrote this. Hmm. So I wrote this for a healthy, happy, and holy new year of 2014. And I wrote, I am ready to release any and all attachments to what I believe my life should be, look like, or turn out to be. I release my front, myself from the idea that what other people think of me matters, and I resolve myself to be true to me. I release the past, my emotional attachments and pains and heartaches. I release my need to be what others want me to be. I release all that I've held on to. I forgive and release anything that has held me back from being discovered for who I am. I release my defensive wall and allow myself to be open to receiving love. I am bursting out into 2014. I am the result of my soul's purpose and heart, heart's desire. I am radiantly shining my being for all to be inspired and motivated by, to be in our personal power. Let me be discovered and allow all the blessings of the universe to shower upon me, open to receive my twin soul flame, my heart connection to the to my truest deep love and spiritual mate. And so I wrote this to myself back in 2014 or 2013 when I was in my yoga teacher training. This is pretty flower on the front. I think that's beautiful. And it's things like this I love to read to see how far I've come and what has manifested in my life and what is going on at the time. Because it's humbling. And you just never know. You just never know. So... That is one of the things that is beautiful about the trainings is that we set intention cards when we um, when we do different trainings and even when I'm doing my beyond addiction I have already put together some stuff to release Whew. powerful stuff powerful stuff and you know what I'm embracing all of it perfectly and divinely as it is because that's what life is it is a journey, it's a flow, and if you allow it to continue and unfold and not get attached to the way you think it should look, just be true to you and be clear of your own intentions and communicate and express yourself, play, allow your inner child to, to dance, to sing, whatever it needs to express. Don't suppress. Don't hold anything back. Don't feel you have to be anything less than who you already are. So, I have this book, and it's another Osho book tonight. And I don't know what's going to come out of this. So this is the Ecstasy, Ecstasy, the forget, Forgotten Language. And a lot of times, um, what people misunderstand with a lot of yogic teachings is they think they hear the word Tantra and I know when I was growing up Tantra just sounded immediately like there's a connotation with it there's a whole oh that's all about sex Tantra is not about sex sex like if you were watching last week when I was reading through the Osho book the difference is there is sexuality and then there is sex and that's the difference between physical in in the physical act of sex and the actual creation that sex is. And sex truly, it's kundalini energy. It's harnessing that energy and turning it into something that truly is sacred. Not the physical act, though that in itself is sacred and should be treated as such. But true kundalini energy harnessed and utilized in the right way it is ecstatic. It is meant to be creative. It's everything that we are. It's awareness. It's embracing. It's, it's, it's what creates. It is what creates on all levels. Okay? So, 
more water, drink up, hydrate. Remember how precious life is because you never know if you have tomorrow. So you should always wake up with gratitude in your heart and appreciation for the day that you are yet to behold because you know you've been breathed into another day to enjoy this life and it should be in joy. Mm. So that's my um, kombucha. Hmm. These are a little bit longer chapters, so I'm going to have to pull out something that's short. And I'm not going to read a whole chapter. Well, maybe I will. You just never know. I can't say I will or won't. Just see what unfolds. Hmm. Here we go. Trust your nature. This is actually quite fun for me. Okay. The way of wisdom, the way of love. So he has what looks to be, I say no na lo nahin te solo. He has some, what appear to be uh, questions in the beginning, but it's it appears to be like the poetry. Oh, how may I ever express that sacred word Oh, how can I say he is not like this and he is like that? If I say that he is within me, the universe is ashamed. If I say that he is without me, it is a falsehood. He makes the inner and the outer worlds to be indivisibly one, the conscious and the unconscious. Both are his footstools. He is neither, neither, manifest nor hidden. He is neither revealed nor unrevealed. There are no words to tell that which he is. That is pointing out polarities and showing that we, we go this way or we go that way. But when we come to center, that can't exist, yet they can't exist without the other, right? When they're whole and they're balanced. Daria ki lahar dario he ji. I think it's transliteration from Hindu. The river and its waves are one surf. Where is the difference between the river and its waves? When the wave rises, it is the water, and when it falls, it is the same water again. Tell me, sir, where is this, the distinction? Because it has been named a wave. Shall it no longer be considered as a wave? Or no longer be considered as water? Within the absolute, the world worlds are being told like beads. Look upon that rosary with the eyes of wisdom. Perception and projection, right? It's still water, even if it's a wave. But you see it as a wave. Hmm. I get a little bit comfy here. This might be this might be a long reading. I'm just saying. So, all righty then. Make yourself cozy. I hope you got something to drink. The truth is known and yet not known. Known in a sense and not known in another. Known because we are part of it, but not known because we are not separate from it. To know something, the knower has to be separate, and yet again, to know something really, how can you know it if you are separate? This is the basic problem that faces a seeker of truth. 
We are one with it. There is no space between us and the truth, so we cannot become the knower. We cannot separate the knower from the knower, the known from the knower. There is no way to separate them, and knowledge exists only when the knower and known are separate. Hmm. Knowledge is a bridge between the object and the subject. If they are not separate, the bridge cannot exist. So the first thing to be remembered, truth is not known in the ordinary sense, cannot be known in the ordinary sense. Right? Yet there is a knowing of sorts, a totally different type of knowing, of a totally different quality. The knowing is more like love than knowledge. You know a woman or a man when you are deep in love. When your boundaries meet and mingle and merge, when you are no longer separate, when you cannot say where you end and where your woman starts, when there are no fences and no defenses, when you are simply overlapping, overflowing into each other, the division has disappeared and you have become indivisible. There is a sort of knowing. You know. Before it, all that you used to think of as knowledge was just illusory. But can you say that now that you know, now there is no one separate who can claim to be the knower? There is the problem. Truth is known, but in such a way that you cannot claim knowledge. Truth is known in such a way that by knowing it, the mystery does not disappear. In fact, it becomes very, very deep, infinitely deep, ultimately deep. By knowing the truth, nothing is solved. In fact, for the first time, you are facing the insolvable, the insoluble. This is the paradox, the dilemma. If you understand this dilemma, then you will be able to follow what Kabir is trying to say. Let us go into it a little more. All knowledge is illusory. We only think what that we know. What do we mean when we say we know? When you say I know this tree, what do you mean? When you say I when when I when you say I know this tree, what do you mean? It is a pine tree or an old oak or something else. What do you know? You know a label. It is a pine or an oak or an ashoka. You know a name. All that your knowledge consists of is that you know the label. Forget the label and the unknown is there. All knowledge consists only of names. Drop the label and subtly the unknown is there. How appropriate tonight, huh? When we talk about labels. How important it is to recognize that a label does not make it knowledgeable, does not make it more profoundly like it's not tangible to you. You don't feel it just because you know it by a name or a label. But we live by naming things. It gives us a false sense of security. Otherwise, everybody is a stranger and it will be too difficult to live with strangers. It will be so difficult to trust strangers. Mind immediately jumps upon anything that comes, labels it, and feels good. Finished. The man is a good man. This man is a sinner. You have labeled it. But you can't observe a s simple reality that the saint can become the sinner the next moment, and the sinner can become the saint. So what do you know? The murderer can become a, Mahamata, a Mahatma, and the Mahatma can become a murderer. So when you say this man is good, what are you saying? Do you know this man because this good man can prove bad any moment? Right? And then and you say another man is bad and he can prove to be the holiest of men any moment. So what do you know? By labeling, by naming, you, you have not known anything. The reality remains unexplained, mysterious. You say this woman is my wife, this man is my husband. What do you know? Just labeling a person, my husband, have you known something? You are just in a deception. You have created an illusion of knowledge. But the mind wants this illusion very much. It feels at ease. With this illusory knowledge surrounding you, you feel at home. Mind lives in lies. Old or new, but mind lives in lies. I have heard. When Herbert Wise, the chess champion, returned to the freshwater college he had attended in his youth, 
The Prexy suggested that he have a look at the dormitory room he had occupied as a student. The lad who was living there at the time unfortunately had chosen this evening to smuggle in a beautiful young co-ed to help him with his history, a gross infraction of rules. When he heard the president and Mr. Wise in the hall, he hid the girl hastily in the clothes closet. Wise looked at the familiar old room, sighed, and remarked, same old desk, same old chairs. Then, when he opened up the closet door, saw the flustered co-ed, added softly, and the same old girl. It is my sister, sir, stammered the young man. And the same old lie, chorted Wise. It continues that way, the same old lies. Mine lives through lies. Mind feeds on lies. Mind cannot encounter truth. All knowledge is of the mind, so all knowledge is bound to be illusory. All knowledge is maya. It is not real. It is a pseudo-coin invented by the mind to fill the gap. Otherwise you will feel very, very ignorant and stupid. Otherwise you will f it will be difficult for you to stand struggle in life. Mind says forget all about ignorance. Knowledge is possible. It is simple. You just cram in a few facts, labels, names, get acquainted with more information, accumulate more information, go to the library and become knowledgeable. Knowledgeableness is not knowledge. And all you have, all your knowledge is nothing but knowledgeableness. You have gathered information from without, from tradition, from the university, from the society, civilization. You say somebody is a Mohammedan, and you say somebody is a Christian. And then you have figured out who he is? Really? Just by calling a man Christian or calling him a communist, have you known him? Have you known anything about him? But you have a feeling that you know him. This man is a communist, dangerous, and this man is a Christian, very good. This stupid effort to drown your ignorance by a false knowledge is the only barrier between you and your reality between you and your truth and if you go on with those lies believing in them you will never come across truth these lies won't allow you these lies will function as barriers i have heard once mullah nasruddin lived next to a lunatic asylum one of his regular afternoon naps on the lawn was rudely interrupted when a beautiful young lady completely without clothes came bursting through the hedge, hotly pursued by three interns dressed in white. The old mullah was just recovering from his astonishment when a fourth intern dashed into view, carrying in each hand a heavy pail full of sand. The mullah noticed that a considerable gallery was watching from the other side of the hedge, so he called out, What is the idea of the fourth intern with the pails of sand? That is his handicapped, was the explanation. He caught her the last time. And even when I look at you, I see you with pails of lies, searching for truth. You are never going to catch it. Your handicap is going to be too much. It is impossible. You have to drop the handicaps. Your mind is the root, of, root cause of all your handicaps. Your mind is a deceiver. It creates a magical world, a false world of knowledge. That is the meaning of the biblical story. Adam is turned out of the Garden of Eden because he has eaten the fruit of the tree of knowledge. It is a very significant parable because of knowledge. Adam is turned out of heaven, loses all his blessedness, loses all his innocence, happiness, loses immortality, becomes immortal, becomes miserable. This is the original sin. Knowledge is the original sin. Meditate on this parable as much as possible again and again from different angles. There is no other parable so significant in the whole history of religion. Adam's sin is knowledge. Then when, what is Jesus' virtue? It must be ignorance. Christians don't talk about it. It must be and it must be ignorance, is what he says. That's what Jesus says. When he says, unless you are like children, you will never not enter the, into the kingdom of your God, of my God. Unless you are like children means unless you are innocent, ignorant like children. 
Unless you drop all of your knowledge, you will not enter. You will not be received back. Knowledge is a sin and ignorance is the virtue. This is what we, we try to remind everyone. It's really going back to your inner child. It's really bringing out the joy, the playfulness that's within you. That, that, that innocence. And even per, for me, the word ignorance is not really the way I would perceive it. It's the awareness. The awareness and the ability to discern between what is and what has been created in the mind. When you're aware of what goes on up in here and where it came from and you can be the witness and allow yourself to go, wow, I am here now in this. It's It just is. Don't be attached to it, right? To be ignorant and to know that all knowledge is fat, false is a radical revolution. Then you remain virgin. Then knowledge never corrupts you. Yes, knowledge is a corruption. It is a poison. All meditative techniques developed anywhere in the world are nothing but efforts to make you free of your knowledge. Efforts to make you free of your mind. Meditation means to create a state of no mind. Hmm. Powerful stuff. A state of no mind will be a state of no knowledge. A state of no mind will be a state of tremendous ignorance, primal ignorance, and ignorance is beautiful. When you don't know, you are not. When you know, you are. Knowledge begins to function as the ego. No knowledge and the ego cannot exist. It has no props, no support. It falls, collapses, disappears. And in the state of no mind, no ego, no you, right, this personality, something happens which is more like love. You flow into existence and existence starts flowing in you. You are no longer separate from existence. The drop has fallen into the ocean and the ocean has fallen into the drop. This is what is called wisdom. Knowledge is not wisdom. To know I don't know anything is wisdom. That is the meaning of the oracle of Delphi's declaration. Somebody asked, who is the greatest wise man of the world? And the oracle said, Socrates. And the person went to Socrates and told him, have you heard it or not? The oracle of the temple has said that you are the wisest man in the world. Socrates is reported to have laughed and said, go back. There must have been some mistake because just today, this morning, it has happened to me that I, didn't, I don't know anything. How can it be? If you had come yesterday, I would have believed you because I used to think that I know, but not now. This morning, this very morning, something tremendous has happened to me. All knowledge has appeared to, appeared as fit, futile. I am awakened. The sleep of knowledge is no longer there. I am no longer dreaming, and now I only know only one thing for certain, that I don't know anything. Go back and tell the oracle that something must have gone wrong. The oracle has always been right and true. I know, but this time the oracle has committed an error. Go and put things right. And it is me, Socrates himself, saying that I am the most ignorant man of the world. How can the oracle say I am the most wise? No, it is not possible. The man was puzzled. He could not believe it. But he went to the oracle and he said, There must have been some mistake, sir, because Socrates denies it. He says, I know only one thing, that I don't know anything. Right? And the oracle said, that's why we have declared that he is the greatest wise man of the world. That's why. That is a precisely why we have declared it. Go and tell him. If you had asked yesterday, we would have said no. We would not have said so. He was as foolish as anybody else. Now he is not a fool at all. He is not fooled by knowledge. He has awakened. Knowing that you don't know, you really become a knower. That is wisdom. Wisdom is not knowledge. Wisdom is awareness. Oh, how I may, how may I ever express that sacred word. 
And when you have known in this way, not of the way of knowledge, but the way of wisdom, the way of love, not as a spectator, not as an observer from the outside, but as a participant of existence, you have danced with God, hand in hand, step by step, and you have come to feel something. Yes, it's better to use the word feeling than knowing. It is closer to reality. Knowing is cerebral. Feeling is total. When you feel, you don't feel only from the head. You don't feel only from your heart. You don't feel only from your guts. You feel from every fiber of your being. Feeling is total. Feeling is orgasmic. Feeling is organic. In a moment of feeling, you function as a totality. When you think, you function only as the head. When you are sentimental, you function only as the heart. Remember, sentimentality is not feeling. Emotionalism is not feeling. Thinking you are a head, just a part of pretending to be the whole. Of course, it is false. This perspective is false. Emotional, sentimental, you are the heart. Again, another part pretending to be the whole. Another servant pretending to be the master. Again, it is false. Feeling is of the total, of the body, of the mind, of the soul. Feeling knows no divisions. Feeling is indivisible. When you feel, you function as a totality. When you function as a totality, you function in tune with the totality. Let me repeat it. When you function as a totality, you function in tune with the totality. When you function as a part of part you have fallen apart, you are no longer in tune with the total. When you are no longer in tune with the total whatsoever, you think you know is false, illusory. When you are in tune with the total, you know that you don't know anything. But even this, not knowing, is a knowing. It is a feeling. It is a love affair with the whole. Hmm. that integration of all, all the senses, mind, body, and soul, right? That is the wholeness. That is the totality. Feeling, not knowing, sensing, essence, pure, purity. Oh, how may I ever express that secret word? And when you come to know in this way, it is a secret knowing Secret because it cannot be expressed. Secret because language is inadequate for it. Secret because it cannot be taught. Let me tell you one thing. In the East, we have been making a distinction between a teacher and a master. The teacher is one who teaches, of course, and the master is one who does not teach. Then what does a master do? A truth can be taught. A teacher teaches. He believes in teaching. He believes that truth can be taught. Of course, this is a basic wrong. Truth cannot be reduced to language. Truth cannot be reduced to concepts. So how can it be taught? Truth cannot be expressed. Nobody has ever been able to express it. So how can it be taught? The teacher himself has not known it yet. The teacher is unaware as the taught. With the teacher you become a student. So whatever whatsoever he has accumulated he goes on transferring it to you. It is a transference of information. A master never teaches, but you can catch something from the master. Truth cannot be taught, but can be caught. The master, his very being, his very presence, his very, even every gesture, the way he looks at you, the way he walks, the way he talks, not what he says, not the content, but the way he talks, the way he keeps quiet, the way sometimes he falls silent. Something between the words and something between the lines. The teacher exists in the words. The master exists between the words. The gaps, the intervals. The teacher has something to teach you. The master has something which, if you want, you can take, but cannot. he cannot teach. If you are ready to and can partake, but he cannot teach. If you are, a, are thirsty, you can quench your thirst. It is not a communication. It is a communion. Between a teacher and a student, there is 
communication. Between a master and the disciple, there is communion, a transference of energy. Something mysterious passes and the disciple becomes pregnant with the unknown. Oh, how I ever express that secret word. How may I ever express that secret word? Kabir is a master and he says, how can I express, however can I express that secret word? That which has happened in the innermost recesses of my being, how can I bring it to the surface? That which has happened in the silence of my soul, how can I reduce it and convert it and translate it into language? Language is very inadequate. Truth is vast and language is very, very narrow. Truth is like the sky and language is like a closed fist. Let me tell you. An elephant was frolicking happily in a swimming pool one day when a mouse came along and implored him to come out of the water. The elephant ignored the mouse for a while, but it became so insistent that the elephant finally lumbered out of the pool to demand, what on earth do you want? The mouse squeaked, I just wanted to see if you were wearing my bathing suit. Yes, to bring truth into words is as impossible, more so. Words are very small, trivial, mundane, material, and worldly. Words are invented by man. Truth is discovered, never invented. It is already there, and truth is discovered when somebody becomes courageous enough to lose himself, to relax into non-being, into a no-mind. Then truth is known. It is known when you, only when you are so utterly silent that not even a ripple of thoughts arise in you. So how to reduce into language, into words, into thoughts? It happens only when thought is not present. Thought can, cannot convey it. And whatsoever thought conveys is a distortion. That's why those who have not, have, who, though, that's why those who have known have always been a gr in great inner difficulty. How to express it? How to say it? When Buddha became enlightened for seven days, he remained silent. He would not utter a single word. It was so difficult. It was. It is so easy to talk when you don't know. It is difficult to talk when you know. It is so easy to talk when you don't know because you can say some anything. When you know it is impossible to talk, you can go around and around. That's what I go on doing. I go on around and around just in the hope that someday by chance by accident you may become aware that whatsoever I want to convey to you cannot be conveyed in words. Listening to my words you may fall silent. Listening to my music you may become so attentive, so alert that in that alertness truth may be able to penetrate you. But I don't believe that through my words you are going to know anything. It is impossible. That's why trust has been emphasized so much. If you listen to my words, you will be listening to my logic. And truth cannot be put into words, so it cannot be made a logical proposition. No, it is not a syllogism. If you are in deep love with me, then there is a possibility. Then you will not be looking for the logic. Then you will be looking for something else. Then you will be looking sideways. Then you will be looking and waiting for silences. Truth is available here in my presence but not in my words. If you listen only to my words, you have not listened to me at all. You have been deaf. If you have listened to my silence, maybe my words can be helpful as a contrast to my silence. When you write on a blackboard with white chalk, it comes out clear and loud because the blackboard gives the contrast. If you write on a wall with white chalk, it will not be clear and loud, it will be lost. I can keep quiet here. I can silently sit here. But then you will not be able to understand my silence at all. It will be writing with white chalk on a white wall. I talk to you. I create a blackboard of words, of language, concept, logic, philosophy, religion, and then I, just, I leave just a few small gaps, silent gaps, intervals. Those gaps come very loudly. Against the blackboard, backboard of language silence comes clearly hence I speak hence Kabir speaks hence Buddha has to concede to speak after seven days 
There was a Zen student under a master to whom he was very devoted. Each time he approached the master, the latter waved his hand, saying, Not yet, not yet. Some time passed. One evening, he became desperate. How can this be? I have no words of instruction which will lead me to the realization. The master simply chases me, saying, Not yet, not yet. What can I do? What do I have to talk about at all? He went on like this, thinking, brooding, meditating, in utter desperation, but tenaciously clinging to his object of inquiry and pondering it from every possible point of view, when all of a sudden something flashed in his mind and he realized all at once what the master wanted him to discover. The following morning he visited the master, wishing to let him know what had happened to him. But the master, seeing him come, burst out, You have it now, you have it now. What happened? For years he was saying, not yet, not yet. Then one day the disciple comes and he not has not even said a single word to the master. And the master says, you have it now, you have it now. The day you understand my silence and not my words, there will be no need for you to tell me that you have attained it. I will know it immediately, even before you. I will know it. There is a very subtle relationship between the master and the disciple. It is almost like a spiritual umbilical cord. The master knows and goes on saying, not yet, not yet. Don't say a single word. It is all foolish whatsoever you have brought. It is all mind stuff whatsoever you have brought. It has nothing to do with the truth. It is still knowledge. Wait, not yet. Don't say anything. In Zen, the disciple meditates on the koan, on a Zen puzzle, and comes to the master, brings a reply of what he has come to understand. The not yet, not yet is for that, that you have not yet understood. Go back, meditate again. For example, the Zen master will say, go and listen to one hand clapping, listening to the sound of the one hand clapping. And the disciple listens and tries and finds out, figures out what to answer, how to find the answer to this puzzle, and then he brings an answer. But the way you come, the quality of conclusion, of the quality of consciousness that you bring, the mind full of ideas and conclusions that you bring, is enough. Your presence is enough for the master to feel, and he says, not yet, not yet. Then one day, suddenly it has happened, and happens out of the blue all of a sudden. In fact, spiritual explosion is exactly an explosion. It is not a gradual process. You don't grow inch by inch. Either you are there, or you are not there. Either you have known, or you have not known. There is no in-between. It is a sudden flash. One meditates, and meditates, and meditates, and goes on penetrating into one's own mind, looking into one's own nature. By this very looking, one day the look is so penetrating that the mind simply stops. Awareness is so total that the mind is no longer being created. Attention is so perfect that the mind dissolves, and there is a lightning, and you suddenly know. You know that nothing can be known you know that ignorance is primordial. You know that life is a mystery and is going to remain a mystery. You know that truth is not only unknown but unknowable. You are freed from the illusion of knowledge. The disciple rushed toward the master to tell him what had happened because when something of such a tremendous import happens, you would like to share it. And then with whom to share? Who will understand you? Only the master can understand. You would like to share it, and when the disciple reached the master, the master said, you have it now, you have it now. He never allowed him to say a single word, word before, and he is not even allowing him now. First he was saying, not yet, not yet. Keep quiet, go back. Now he says, no need to come. You have known, keep quiet. When truth is known, you cannot say it. That's why the master says, I know you that you have known it. Now keep quiet. Now sit in silence in front of me. Now let us be together, really together. Now let me overflow in you and you overflow in me. Now let there be a communion. Let soul meet with soul. Now there is no need for one mind to communicate with the other mind. You hold the hand of your friend that's a communication on the physical level. 
You say something to your friend that is a communication on the mental level. Then you just remain in the presence of your friend saying nothing, gesturing nothing, having nothing to say, just pure presence. Then, then it is a spiritual communication. That communication is called communion. I am trying to create a community here, a community of san sannyasins. Community means people who are waiting for or trying to have communion. Community means people who are being together to dissolve into each other. So, who's, so whosoever is here with some egoist idea is not here at all. He will miss me and he will miss this communion community that exists here. Some people come to me and say, in this ashram, people don't seem to be much interested in others. They don't take much interest. This person is on some ego trip. He wants people to take an interest in him. Why should they take an interest in him? Here we are creating a situation where which nobody is going to help your ego. Nobody is going to give you importance. If you are seeking importance, then there is the big world. In my small world, if you come, don't seek importance. Don't seek attention. Rather become attentive. Rather become aware and try to dissolve into the community that is getting ready here. And it is easier for you to dissolve into it right now because it is the beginning of the process. Once it has gone far deeper, it will be more difficult for you to take the jump because there will be a great gap. Right now, there is not much of a gap, a very small gap. You can take the jump very easily. Oh, how may I ever express that secret word? Oh, how can I say he is not like this and he is not like that? How to say God is like this or God is like that? There are many problems. First, language is not adequate. Second, the listener is not ready. You appear to be listening, but you don't listen. Because listening needs a tremendous sensitivity. Your whole being should become your hearing. You should hear from every cell of your body, from every hair of your body. You should hear from the eyes, from the hands, from the soles of your feet. You should hear with your totality. You just should become ears. And I'm going to stop there. And I hope that that touches some of you out there that have been listening because it's pretty profound to really step into the knowing that knowledge is not true awareness it is it, it's not totality you're not gonna find it in all the information out there it's not something you can speak or put words to it is just being completely all mind, body, soul, all of your senses embracing it, the essence of all that is. It's awareness without the information. And it's the rewriting of stories without the words. It's the returning to that childlike nature that sense that you had when you were a child and everything was awesome and exciting and the breathing in life and the nourishing that it gives you and that's what gives you life right master your breath master your mind you master your life and that mind is not supposed to master you and most of us are are recovering from an overly controlling mind, right? I hope you've enjoyed tonight's journal hook'em. It's time for me to sign off, and I hope you enjoyed this. If you did enjoy it, please share. Reach out to those you know that might appreciate it just as much. And you never know, a little, a little hook'em never hurt. Keep it raw, stay rad. I love you all. Have an amazing, sweet dreams and motivational Monday.